Welcome to Finding Holiness, where we delve into timeless Torah wisdom, revealing the sacred in everyday moments. Join us on a journey to elevate your spirituality and discover holiness in every aspect of life. I'm your host, Rabbi David Kadosh, and together, let's embark on a path of spiritual exploration. I hope you enjoy this next episode. Erev Tov, everybody. Welcome to another edition of our Monday night Shi'ur on the Amidah, setting the works of Rabbi Zavlev Shlita. We are, what can we say, almost halfway through the Shmona Esrei. Tonight we are beginning the ninth Beracha, the Beracha of Parnasa, otherwise known as Birkat HaShanim. Some call it Birkat HaParnasa, as it deals primarily with the sustenance and um, all the uh, the wealth that we request from God. It's a very, very important bracha, bracha that a lot of people pay a lot of attention to because Parnassah is something that we need. And uh, with your permission, tonight and over the next few weeks, we are going to um, delve deep into this bracha. However, I'm going to be upfront and say mm-hmm. that uh, it's going to take a few, maybe two or three weeks as a little, just an introduction, not an introduction to the text, but just getting the basic idea of how Parnasa works, a lot of great secrets that uh, we'll share over the next uh, week or two or three. So uh, I ask you to um, bear with me and enjoy all the wonderful, uh, you know, little yalomim, diamonds of uh, of information that we're going to give tonight and over the next couple of weeks. So again, welcome everybody here listening live um, virtually, and as well those that are listening on the recording on the podcast, FindingHoliness.com, FindingHoliness.Buzzsprout.com. If you want to look at all the uh, archives, you can go check out our website if you want to catch up. If it's your first time listening, um, lots available there. And um, of course, if you would like to sponsor uh, or support the podcast, the link is there as well, FindingHoliness.com. You can contact me privately. Um, lots of ways to do that. As well. Okay, so Birkata Shanim, Birkata Parnasa. Um, we'll open like this. The the Rosh Yeshiva of Tells would say famously that just like the physical world functions in a orderly function, and just one change can cause it to alter, the same with the spiritual world and its daily miracles. Earth, for example, revolves on an axis, and if that was to be one degree more away from the sun or one degree closer to the sun, we would either freeze to death or we would burn to death. Um, Everything is done exactly, and it's exact how HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants it to be. Um, When there's a natural disaster, whether the earthquake took place in this spot or that spot will determine whether or not um, hundreds of thousands of people will die or just a few people will get injured. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is very precise when it comes to the physical world. And at the same time, the spiritual world must also revolve around that idea that if, some, if there's some small change it really, really has an impact on the um, on the people around us, the society in general. Every mitzvah that we do, every time we raise a level of spirituality amongst ourselves, amongst the things around us, we are really actually changing the world for the good. And chas shalom, if we do the opposite and we don't, then for the not good. The Arizal says that every physical reaction has a physical counterpart. It contains a divine spark. That's one of the meanings of the Pasuk in Sefer Devarim. Lo al halechem levado adam. That we, man does not just sustain himself only on lechem, on bread. It's not only the physical. There's a spiritual. Because of the sin of Adam and Chava, we are now made to work for our parnasa. The fruits that that were before the sin, the fruits that grew on the tree, were meant to provide nourishment of both physical nourishment and spiritual nourishment. 
This is what was supposed to be had Adam and Chava not eaten from the Aitzadat Overa. Instead, now we have Bezeat Apecha Tochal Lechem. With the sweat of your brow, that's how you're going to eat bread. And we work and we toil. And uh, we go through agony. We perspire. We sweat. And it's not easy just to make, a, just to make, and me just to make a, a, uh, a parnasa. The Gemara and Masechet Kiddushin says as follows, Daf Pe Bet Amur Aleph. If animals who were created to serve man was provided with food and shelter without any toil, without any work, then surely man, human beings, whose job is to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, would be as well. It would only make sense that this is the case, that we could do this. But we're not. We don't, we don't get to attain this without toil. Because of Adam and Haba, we have our physical needs in order to use or to make use of our spiritual needs, which is the priority. And that comes with toil. That comes with work. Work brings someone and something to appreciation, to being grateful. Otherwise, when things come easy, then we pay no attention to it. If I work on a project and I spend hours and hours studying, working on this project to perfect it, then I feel accomplished when that project is a success. The same thing is when I go about an educational degree. In whatever field that a person studies in, medicine, law, business, marketing, a person spends years in post-secondary education to attain that degree. He writes multiple exams, many essays, spends many hours reading books and theories, so on and so forth to reach a goal, to graduate. When a person finishes, he, he feels, wow, I've accomplished something. But if, the, if, if what he's working to did, didn't come easy, sorry, if a person, if a person whatever he worked to did come easy to, then okay, big deal. I have a natural skill. I remember things quite easily. So I don't, I don't need to read books. Okay, so I don't feel accomplished as much. I didn't put in that work. Says Rabbi Lef, because of that, we shouldn't call it making a living. We don't really make a living as we go around in life, but rather we implement Hashem's plan. Hashem's plan was that from Rosh Hashanah, this is what was supposed to happen. This is how much money I was supposed to make. And now I'm implementing that plan through my work and through my toil. And our material life and our possessions and our wealth, whether they become a positive factor or a negative factor in our life, depends on the blessings and the recognition of God in those objects. And by doing so, we make something more meaningful. We make the object more meaningful, make the life more meaningful. And that's the reason, by the way, why we recite Berachot before we eat. It's the reason why we say brachot after we eat. Before we eat, we recite blessings called birkot nehenin. Blessings of, of things that, that nourish us, that provide us with benefit and enjoyment and pleasure. And then we have beracha harona. The blessings that come afterwards, that could be either birkat amazon, that could be me'en shalos, otherwise known as ala mechia, bore nefashot. Birkot nehenin, the blessings that come before are rabbinic in nature. Those are blessings that were instituted by the by the rabbis. Birkat Amazon, the blessing that comes afterwards, is biblical. It's one of the six hundred and thirteen mitzvot. If you think about it, it should have been the opposite. Like, if you had to choose when to bless, bless God when you're hungry. Bless God, bless God before you want to eat. Before I'm, oh my God, I I I gotta have that apple. I gotta have that steak. I gotta have that, that that should be the biblical blessing. The answer is no. It's the exact opposite, because securing material and wealth or pleasure, whatever it is that you are benefiting from, 
That's not the main goal. That's not the main effort that's required. But rather, it's a recognizing the good of that substance. Because when a person is hungry, it's obvious he knows he's dependent on God. So automatically he blesses him. I need God, I'm hungry. But when he's full, when a person is satiated, he's prone to forget him. Pasuk says in Sefer Devarim, Vaishman Yeshurun Vaivat. And Yeshurun, referring to Bnei Israel, became fat and rebelled. Shamanta Avita Kasita. You grew fat, thick, and rotund. Vaitoshelo'asau. And Israel forsook the God who made them by Nabel Tsureshuato and spurned the rock of their salvation. Because you became fat, because of all the food that you ate, all of a sudden you forgot about God. You forgot what He gave you. That's why it's only ve'achalta ve'savata, that's when ve'uberachta. You ate and you were satiated, now you have to bless. Of course, Pekat Amazon is really divided into uh, four blessings. The first three are the ones that are biblical in nature. The first Beracha talks about Hashem sustaining us and everything. Baruch Hashem Hazan Etakol. That's the first theme of, of, of the Birkat Amazon. And number two and number three, the second and third Beracha, are the, the spiritual purposes that Hashem provides through that food. So blessing number two would be Berit Torah. And ala aretz ve'al amazon, it's the Torah and it's Israel. And blessing number three is Yerushalayim uh, and the Bet Hamikdash, which of course represents the heart of every Jew. It goes from a very general way of thinking of how God, how God sustains and feeds everybody, to a very more specific, more focused teach uh, to to Yerushalayim and the Bet Hamikdash. More focus in our in our perception of of Parnasa. When we're young, we think of really just everything in a general sense. Everything just needs to work out. You don't realize how much it's affecting you as a little kid, especially as even as you go older into adolescence or teenagers. All right, things are great. I'm happy. The world's running. But as you get older and you start looking back at your life, you really start to pinpoint and say, look how Kadosh Baruch Hu did this for me exactly. How, how every decision affected me and my own individual parnasa, my family's parnasa, as part of the klal, obviously, but it's a more focused approach. And Bikat Amazon follows that line of reasoning. The Gemara Masechet Pesachim Daf Kuf Yudchet also says that earning a livelihood is as difficult as Kiryat Yamsuf, as difficult as splitting a sea. And where where the Gemara asks, where do we learn this from? Now I'm immediately. Where do we learn this that it says difficult to splitting a seed? Well, it's based on a chapter in Tehilim of the Halel Gadol, all the Kilo Lam Chasto chapter, where there's a juxtaposition of two pesukim, where one of them says Le Gozer Yamsuf Ligzarim Kilo Lam Chasto, and then it says Noten Lechem Lechol Basar Kilo Lam Chasto. So God split the sea into parts Kilo Lam Chasto. And noten lechem echol basar, he gives bread to all of mankind, ki lo hasto. And from the fact that these two pesukim are uh, are there uh, together, so that's how we know that the parnasa is as difficult as keriat yamsuf. Uh, Chachamim asks a question. If you actually open the book of Tehillim, you will find that these two pesukim are not next to each other. Yes, they're in the same chapter, but they're not really next to each other. They're 12, they're 12 verses apart. So what, what kind of proof, what kind of closeness and juxtaposition are we talking about here? The Gemara uses this as a, as a proof. Ah, look, Parnasa is like Kiryat Yamsu, because they're right next to each other. They're not right next to each other. They're 12 Pesukim apart. So the answer is that there are 26 verses in that Mizmor of Tehillim, which represent, of course, Hashem's holy name of Yud Ke Vavke, which is numerical value of 26. The first 10 Pesukim in that chapter correspond to the Yud. The next 5 correspond to the He. The next 6 correspond to the Vav. And the final 5 correspond to the last the last He. Le gozer yamsuf ligzarim ki leolam hasto. 
Hashem who divided the sea into parts, Kid Olam Chasdo, is the third verse in the first hey. The third verse in the first hey. Noten Lechem Lechol Basar is the fourth verse in the final hey. So we see third and fourth in the haze, there is a close connection. That's a connection over there. Why do we compare the giving of Parnassah to Kerayat Yamsuf? There's a few, there's many answers to this question. Many have attempted to answer this question. Some of them are fantastic. I want to share a few of them with you tonight. One way of thinking about this is that by Yamsuf, Bnei Israel weren't really in an actual real danger but Hashem there were there were there were yes the Egyptians were behind them but there was the cloud they didn't really have anywhere to go but Hashem put them there on purpose he put them in that predicament so that they can pray Hashem desires the prayers of the tzaddikim we see this over and over again throughout Tanakh and the reason is because it enhances them spiritually when a person puts all of his trust and emunah in God it really changes a person deep down inside. With regards to Parnassah, all of the Parnassah is decided in advance. But Akados Baruch Hu gives us tests. Sometimes business is good, sometimes business is not good. Sometimes you're, you, you start contemplating, is this the right job for me, is this not the right job for me? Maybe I can do better somewhere else. These are all tests in order to rely on... Anakadosh Baruch Hu. Rashi tells us in Masechet Ta'anit that the purpose of the rain cycle is so that people recognize its benefit and pray for it. And it also talks about this in, in Sefer Bereshit when, when rain is, the whole concept of rain is introduced. That's why rainfall and Parnassah is, is mentioned in, in, in Masechet Ta'anit as to be only in the hands of God. While many, many things are in the hands of his messengers and angels, Refua for one of them is in the hands of, of angels. But when it comes to rainfall and Paranasa, those are one of the things that are in the that are in the hands of uh, of Akados Baruch Hu, not with any other agent. Because our job is to recognize the benefit of, of the rain, the Paranasa, and what it does for us. Going back to that. Mishnah Masechet Kiddushin, Daf, Pei Bet Amur Aleph. It's a Mishnah that I strongly encourage our listeners tonight, again live or on recording, to remember. Uh, try to remember many Mishnah Yot, but this is definitely one that really, really strikes a chord when you hear it and you internalize it. The Mishnah is in the name of Rabbi Meir. And Rabbi Meir Omer, Rabbi Meir says, Le'olam yelamed adam et beno, umanut nekiya bekala. A person should always teach his son a clean and easy trade. Teach him something. Carpenter, electrician, plumber, computer engineer, doctor if he has the ability. Teach him something clean and easy. Ve'it palel. Le'mi she'ha'osher and after you teach him, pray for success to God, God whom the wealth and the property belong to. Why? She'en umanut, she'en ba'aniyut va'ashirut. For there is no trade on earth that does not include both poverty and wealth. Shelo aniyut min ha'umanut, velo ashirut min ha'umanut. Poverty does not come from a particular trade, nor does wealth come from a particular trade. Ela hakol lefi zechuto. But rather, everything is in accordance with a person's merit. So you choose something clean and easy to teach your son. Pray to God for success. Is this not totally the opposite of what we are taught in society? How your job is going to dictate the money that you make, the amount of schooling that you take will dictate the money that you make, 
This is what we're taught. Just because you are an accountant does not mean that you are going to become wealthy from being an accountant. And it does and and just because you are a person who may have a lower class job, that doesn't mean that you're going to remain an Ani. I read a uh, an interesting article the other day on one of the uh, financial websites. Stories about individuals who, who made it big. Made it big. Like this person, there's many. This person would go to thrift stores. To thrift stores. And he would shop. Used clothing, used items. And he would take these items, buy them for, do- for pennies. Just a couple bucks. And resell them. This was his profession. I don't know if he went to school. I don't know what education he has. But his annual income is six figures. Six figures. And that's one guy working. If he starts now hiring other people to do the buying for him, who knows? He can he can have a, a seven-figure revenue if he wanted. What's he doing? He's going to thrift stores to buy used items to sell it. Genius. He goes online. He sells them for more. Sometimes, you know, it's a, what what would what would our ancestors, what would our teachers say to a person who had this idea? What are you going to be in life? I'm going to go to a thrift store to buy used clothing and used items and used pots and pans and used sunglasses, and I'm going to sell them on eBay for a profit. You're going to think you're crazy. You're going to end up like no, because it's not it's not the profession that provides you with the wealth or the or the poverty. It's HaKadosh Baruch Hu. I do my toil, I do my work, I pray to God that everything turns out okay, and then it turns out okay. Chavetz Chaim, on this Mishnah, brings a beautiful analogy of a person who's carrying a, a heavy load, and all of a sudden, a guy comes by with his wagon, and he says, Hey, Habibi, I see you're, you're struggling over there. You want a lift on my wagon? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. So he comes up, and he loads, he loads himself on the wagon with the heavy load. And then uh, they're riding along, and the driver looks back, and he still sees that the guy sitting in the back has the load still on his shoulders. So the driver says, Habibi, what's, ha- what's happening? What, what, why are you holding the load on your shoulder? So the guy answers, you, know, you were so kind to carry me in the wagon. I would never think to ask you also to carry my package. So what's in the mashal? What do we learn from the mashal? If Hashem can provide us with the very basics of life, can He also not provide us the parnasa and the sustenance and the extra things even without our help? Of course He can. Of course He can. So that's answer number one of why parnasa is compared to the splitting of a sea. Another answer why it's compared to the splitting of a sea is that Kiryat Yamsuf was ordained from creation. Jews just had to get there to make it happen. So too Parnasa is also preordained, but we have to make the effort to receive the Parnasa. And like we mentioned at the beginning, this effort is resulted for two reasons. Number one, we have the curse from Adam HaRishon. Adam and Chava, who showed lack of awareness that he needed to uplift the physical to a spiritual level. And number two, effort is necessary in order to give the appearance that things look natural. Because by doing so, it doesn't look miraculous. Because if it looks miraculous and something goes off, then people will think the system is flawed. We spoke about this this past Shabbat in our drasha about what people's perception is. And if there's everything that is natural, people tend to always focus on the natural and not really that is it's God-driven. So we actually have to do that to give it a natural appearance because if we do it all miraculous, people aren't at the level to, to know that it's miraculous. So even though, yes, miracles are part of the natural order, Nature is just a constant miracle that we must learn to see. But I carry my load 
because I understand people, the general public can't understand otherwise. The Midrash tells us that there are three gifts that Hashem bestowed upon the world. Wisdom, power, and wealth. These are the three gifts. A person who merits this possesses all that is precious in the world. This is what the Midrash writes. But it's only true when the presents are divine. When they don't come from Hashem, they will eventually be lost. So what does this mean when the presents are divine, when wisdom, power, and wealth are divinely ordained? What does that mean? The answer is, when we perceive the value of these items as something that is given by HaKadosh Baruch Hu, if I realize that my wisdom or my wealth or my power is given to me by God, then yes, I will gain from it. If it's from myself, if I think that I'm the one that brought my, my wealth and my power, then I won't. If the presents are divine, then I, I have to use them in the service of God. The Egyptians, at the time of Kiryat Yamsuf, they saw the sea split for the Jews. And they said to themselves, wow, if they manage to get through, then maybe the sea is going to remain split for us. But they didn't know that the salvation of their of, of the Jews was their own was their own destruction. It was a present to Bene Israel. It was a power that was divinely ordained to the Jewish people, but not to the Egyptians. The lesson is we can't mimic the methods of Parnassah that were successful to others, thinking that they will work for me. It's not the job, but rather it's the merit and prayer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for success. That's why the sea was split into 12 parts. It's a beautiful Hidush. Because each individual salvation is independent of another's. And we can't be jealous. We can't look at our friend and say, Ah, if he got the Parnassah that way, certainly I will. That's what the Egyptians thought. And look what happened to them. God has a plan for every person. The sea was split in 12 different ways. Every person had a different way out. The goal was salvation. Everyone will receive salvation. How you get there, you're different than your brother, you're different than your sister. A third answer, named of Rabbi Shaya Pinto, he writes, We were saved at Yam Suf even though we were undeserved to be saved, undeserved to be saved. We were idol worshippers. And so too, Hashem provides Parnasa even though it may be undeserved. It's an advance. It's an advance for a future Zechut merit that if we serve Akadosh properly, Akadosh Baruch Hu properly. And he'll give us what we need. Some even say that Hashem gave the Jewish people coming out of Yamsuf all that gold and all that jewelry, even though that he knew that they were going to take that gold and make the golden calf. Why? Because he allows us to exercise the hirah of sheet, free will, even though it's difficult for him to watch a sin. But he has hope. He has emuna in us. He has belief in us that we're going to do the right thing and not to attribute success to ourselves, but rather attribute it to Him. And lastly, says the Maharal, that earning a livelihood is a very, very delicate balance between Hishtadlut and the trust that Hashem will, will provide. The work that I put forth and that God is going to give me what I need. And the same with the splitting of the sea. Hashem showed the world that He is clearly in charge, even though B'nai Israel had to walk through to get it to split. Even though there needed to be a Nachshon ben Aminadav who had to go and water up to his nostrils. That was the Hishtadlut. But in the back of their mind, Hashem tells Moshe, Why are you here praying for? Just go. It's going to happen. You just got to take those those few steps. And to conclude tonight's tonight's class, part one of 
maybe three or four of this beracha. To one of the most di- this idea is one of the most difficult things to remember. The idea that it's not you. The idea that it's not kochi ve'otzem yadi asalita ha'ilazeh, that it was my strength, it was my hand. It can't be. This was a mistake that the Jewish people made in the, in the desert, leaving the desert, in the way into Eretz Yisrael. What took place in the 40 years in the Midbar was, it's called Hanhaga Nisit. Everything was HaKadosh Baruch Hu's miraculous hand directing them. The man, the Be'er Miriam, the Selav, pillar of cloud, pillar of fire, everything, everything was miraculous. Nothing, nothing made natural sense in the desert. How you live in a desert for 40 years, it just nothing makes sense. Everything was was mamasha, hand of God. Nisim beniflaot, anagani sit. Transferring to Eretz Israel was going to change from hanagani sit to hanagati v'ait. It was going to go all of a sudden to a natural course. No more man. No more selav. No more be'er miriam. Now they have to work. Now they have to pray for their parnasa. B'nai Israel concluded that they could do it on their own and that they would be in charge of what was going to take place and occur in Eretz Yisrael, but that was a mistake. Hashem is still in control, but He's just hiding His face. It's more Hesir Panim now, rather than in the desert where He was more Galui. B'nai Israel could understand this. So they demanded from Moshe to send spies into the land. And Moshe was trying to prove them that what they were thinking, whatever they were thinking was wrong. And, and how was he going to prove them wrong? He told them, I want you to go in, I want you to take the fruits. You're going to see, you can't conquer this land without, without God's assistance, without God's help. Take the fruit. What do you mean take the fruit? Why do you, why do you tell the, the, the spies to take the fruit for? This was an illusion. It was a remez. So that they understand the necessity of God providing parnasa. It was a whole different way of living. But they didn't listen. And they came back. And the rest is history. Which led to Tisha B'Av. The ninth of Av, a day of mourning. It's a day of mourning not because they maligned Eretz Yisrael. They spoke harshly about the land. That's not why it's a day of mourning. It's a day of mourning because they wouldn't accept that philosophy that was trying to be instilled to them by Moshe Rabbeinu prior for them going in. They didn't accept the the philosophy that got them to believe in something that was unconventional. And that's why, till today, Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, is a day to gain faith and trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu rather than just dwelling on a feeling of hopelessness and helplessness. Yes, it's a day that we sit and we cry that we don't have the Bet HaMikdash, but it's also a day to look up and say, okay, Hashem, we know we made wrong. We know we made wrong. We know we did a mistake. We're ready We're ready to, to leave it all up to you. And only then, that's when Mashiach is going to come. Mashiach will be born on Tisha B'Av. Once that recognition comes into play, until that happens, then we continue to suffer in Galut, generation after generation. And so it is our job and our duty to have this initial kavana, just getting started here in this discussion of Parnasa. Never ever think it's kochi ve'otzem yadi asali Understand that, that there are a lot of steps that is required for us to attain the, our Parnasa full, uh, wholeheartedly. And it begins with the total, total belief and emunah that it comes, that it comes, uh, that it comes from God. I invite you to join me next time as we continue this discussion on our Amida on the ninth beracha Birkat Hashanim Birkat Parnasa. Thank you everybody for joining. Wishing everyone a wonderful night ahead.